Well, we are back in the book of Hebrews this week, so I encourage you to turn to chapter 6. We'll be reading verses 13 through 20, both in the New King James and the Amplified Version. Hebrews chapter 6, follow along as I begin reading with verse 13 in the New King James Version. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things <clears throat> in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And then the, then the same text in the Amplified Version. For when God made his promise to Abraham, he swore by himself, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, saying, Blessing, I certainly will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you. And so it was that he, Abraham, having waited long and endured patiently, realized and obtained in the birth of Isaac as a pledge of what was to come, what God had promised him. Men indeed swear by a greater than themselves, and with them in all disputes the oath taken for confirmation is final, ending strife. Accordingly, God also, in his desire to show more convincingly and beyond doubt to those who were to inherit the promise of uh, the unchangeableness of his purpose and plan, intervened or mediated with an oath. This was so that by two unchangeable things, his promise and his oath, in which it was impossible for God ever to prove false or deceive us, we who have fled to him for refuge might have mighty indwelling strength and strong encouragement to grasp and hold fast the hope appointed for us and set before us. Now we have this hope as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. It cannot slip and it cannot break down under whoever steps out upon it. A hope that reaches farther and enters into the very certainty of the presence within the veil. Where Jesus has entered in for us in advance. A forerunner having become a high priest forever after the order with the rank of Melchizedek. So the title of the message is Hope for Wanderers, Backsliders, and Reprobates. And this applies to everybody who names the name of Christ because at one time or another, we've all wandered from the Lord, backslide from the Lord, and have the seeds of apostasy growing within us, not coming to a conclusion, thank God, but growing to some smaller or lesser degree. I remember one such a person who almost apostatized from the faith. I had counseled him several times. He had been walking with God, had a profession of faith for several decades. His walk was not close with the Lord. He had made a profession of faith at one time and then off and on continued here and there, attending church and keeping up with a few of the outward means of grace, but really was not faithful to God. And one day God convicted him of his sin. He came down with cancer and had lived about six months after that. But during that time, God used his cancer to bring him back to the Lord, to repent of his sin and return to the Lord in the way of his heart. And he had an outpouring of assurance of salvation like he had not had since the beginning of his conversion. So there is hope. There is indeed hope for all of us who claim to be God's children, to be Christians, 
who wander from God, who backslide, even wander very, very far from God for a long period of time. And now by way of introduction, with that open, let me direct your attention to the text. Having finished the third warning passage in Hebrews, which was chapter 5, verse 11, through chapter 6, verse 12, in the last message, we come to the last section of Hebrews chapter 6, which is verses 13 through 20. Now, in case anyone misunderstands the Apostle Paul's strong exhortation in this third warning section leading up to our present text, <clears throat> Paul ends this section with a tremendous positive appeal to those who are wavering and struggling Christians that they might persevere in the faith and press on to spiritual maturity. This appeal is designed to do several things. First, to jumpstart the growth process which has stopped or even reversed in many of the lives of his readers. And this applies to us today as well. This appeal in our text, verses 13 through 20, is designed to stop believers from looking back to the world and to look to Christ. It's also designed to remove the doubts, fears, weaknesses, the guilt, the blindness, the lukewarmness, and forgetfulness that many believers were paralyzed by for a long time and replace that paralysis with hope and faith, peace, assurance, and renewal in the spirit. It's designed, this, this appeal in verses 13 through 20 is designed after this very strong warning in the context to have believers come back onto the path of spiritual maturity, to leave the negative wanderings and backslidings behind, to wake up and come back to the path of spiritual maturity, spiritual liveliness, and spiritual life. It's also designed to bring maturity to a level of resilience and consistency and faithfulness that these believers had never experienced before. The Lord wanted these struggling Christians who were looking back, thinking about going back to their old lives, to not only repent of their sin, but to move on to a place of growth in their relationship with God and maturity that they have never really experienced before. He wants them to move forward and to move on. Now, the closing section of chapter 6 relates closely to the exhortation in verse 12, the verse immediately preceding our text. <clears throat> to press on with faith and, and, and patience in making spiritual progress. Are you and I pressing on in faith and patience, making spiritual progress? tangible, even palpable progress, identifiable progress, confirmed by the Spirit of God in our inner man. This is the message of verse 12 in preparation for what he is about to say. And what he does say in verses 13 through 20 is intended to alleviate the fears of worldly, backslidden believers struggling with sin and weakness, that God would not condemn them. Paul wants to remind these believers that though they may really be struggling, doubting their salvation, experiencing the greatest trial of their faith in the years and months immediately preceding this strong warning passage, he wants them to know that nonetheless, God is not going to condemn them. They are not going to lose their salvation. 
and Abraham is used as, as an example to once again arouse their faith and to remind them of the certainty of the believer's hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, a hope that fades not away. He speaks loudly to Christians today who are looking back on their past life and wrestling with the same seeds of apostasy that they've struggled with for a long time and have not dealt with and have not crossed over a line and moved forward in spiritual maturity and development. And you know, there's a massive amount of church-going people today who are not making spiritual progress and are battling against the same pressures and temptations that they had in their pre-Christian days to actually go back to their old lives. We look at the state of the church around us and man is the book of Hebrews more relevant and applicable to every professing Christian today in 2019. Now, the writer gives three arguments for the certainty of the salvation of true believers in Hebrews chapter six, at the end of chapter six. In verses 13 through 15, the first argument is God's promise. The second argument is in verses 16 through 18, God's oath. And the third is in verses 19 and 20, God's son. God's promise, God's oath, and God's son. Let's look at the first one, God's promise, verses 13 through 15. For when God made a promise to Abraham, as Christians there are times when it seems like everything is against us. Isn't that so? And we have all the disadvantages in this world and no advantages. Everywhere we turn, it seems like Christians are at the bottom of the barrel in terms of having advantages. We rarely have advantages over people in the world, over non-Christian people. We're the ones that have given up everything for Christ. We've sacrificed everything of this world for him, and we have little or nothing of this world to show for it. Any advantage or lasting blessing we have is in the future after we leave this world. Our doubts and struggles are frequent. Our temptations seem to get stronger and stronger, don't they? So how can we be sure that our hope in Christ is not in vain? Wouldn't it be better just to stop struggling some of these professing Christians are thinking in the immediate context and just go back to the world where we were before our so-called conversion? Well, no, it's not better to go backwards. There is no place to go except to Christ. The part of the answer, part of the answer rather, is found in God's promise to Abraham, which is recorded in Genesis 22. Why don't we turn there because the Apostle Paul quotes this passage in our text. Genesis 22, verses 16 and 17. This is the promise that God made to Abraham. Part of the Abrahamic covenant. He says in Genesis twenty-two sixteen, 16, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, Blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. Now remember, Abraham is an example of all believers who struggle with doubts and complacency. Do you struggle with complacency and doubts? I do. I do once in a while. But God's promise to Abraham included much more than large numbers of physical descendants. That's part of the promise. The promise also included all that he would provide in the person of Christ, Christ himself, and to Abraham's spiritual offspring. That is, the promise was also that Abraham would have a spiritual seed, which includes you and I if we're believers. There's the physical descendants, the physical seed, 
There's the spiritual seed, which includes all believers, and then there's Christ himself. All three of those things were included in this promise, the Abrahamic covenant. This is important because the book of Hebrews is primarily addressed to the spiritual seed, many of whom are looking back like Lot's wife, not forward in faith like Abraham. Despite Abraham's failures and sins though, God kept his promise. He kept his part of the covenant. And God saw, the, or Abraham saw the physical part of that promise fulfilled in the birth of Isaac. Many of God's promises then do not depend on our character, but on God's faithfulness. Abraham made mistakes. He committed sins. But the promise was fulfilled because of the one who made it. Abraham is a role model of faith and hope in God and his promises, especially for struggling Christians. These one, these in the first century, and those of us today who are thinking about going back to the world, who are going through really difficult times, wrestling hard with sin and temptation. Every day, the conflict with the world, the flesh, and the devil. And often, we're reflecting upon our struggles in the flesh, and we think about how, can I just take a year off and get drunk and do drugs and this, that, and the other thing, and just, and just anesthetize my, spirit, my physical senses for a little while, like Noah did and got drunk and after he planted a vineyard? How long was he drunk off and on? Who knows? The flesh wears out and we, some, justify getting comforted by substances rather than by the Holy Spirit. And it's instead of turning to Christ in faith, faith in his promises, like Abraham clung to the promise of God for 25 years. From age 75, when God gave him the promise, until he was 100 years old. Abraham is a role model of faith. And Abraham did not have the scriptures, by the way. Abraham's faith flourished because it fastened upon two facets of God's dealings with him. God's promise and God's oath. And God brings this up to new covenant believers. Now you remember from Old Testament history, a promise of many descendants was given to Abraham while he was still in Haran, recorded in Genesis chapter 12, verses one through three. That's the first passage in which God makes a covenant with Abraham and then God confirms that covenant in several subsequent passages in the book of Genesis. It was repeated when he arrived at Shechem in Genesis 12, just a few verses after, in verses six and seven, and reiterated on several occasions after that. Abraham was encouraged and supported spiritually off and on by these promises. He embraced them, he fell back on these promises, he clung to them and waited for 25 years until he was 100 years old when Isaac was finally born and the, and the promise was fulfilled. When Isaac had grown into, into young manhood, God commanded Abraham to offer Isaac as a sacrifice on Mount Moriah. At the last moment, God stopped Abraham's hand from plunging the knife into his son. And after this dramatic act of Abraham's faith, God renewed his promise of many descendants and confirmed it at that time with an oath. He gave the promise first, and then in Genesis 22, 17, he confirmed the original promise he covenanted with Abraham back in chapter 12 with an oath in Genesis 2, 22 and 17, which is the passage that is quoted in our text. So Abraham's faith, having grown through years of waiting, 25 years of waiting, led at last to the fulfillment of this hope that he would have a line of descendants through whom all nations would be blessed. 
That hope found its ultimate fulfillment, as I mentioned, in Jesus Christ who suffered and died and rose from the dead to save the spiritual seed of Abraham from death and hell. And this is the point. Christians today have more of God's promises than Abraham did. He basically clung to one promise. One. That God is going to give him a son. And through that son, another son, and through that line, Christ would come and there would be more believers in the spiritual seed than Abraham could count in the stars. We have thousands of promises in the scripture, thousands, that are of equal weight and power to the promise God gave to Abraham. Yes, it is trusting God's promise when you're at your worst and thinking about going back to the world. Looking for a rock, steadfast foundation that you can count on in the midst of the fiery trial in your thoughts and in your hearts when the world is being dangled like a carrot in front of your eyes saying, come back, come back. You need a rock-like promise. But what was it exactly that not only kept Abraham's faith alive, but listen, but kept his faith growing and spiritual progress and maturity increasing over time? And this is where where we go wrong, and this is where Abraham did something right and didn't give up and he kept growing. His faith kept increasing over time. He kept maturing in his relationship with God and in his faith. His progress was not stunted. What was it? He looked to the character of God who gave the promise. Remember, verse 13 says, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. We're talking about the promise now. God's promise to Abraham. And this brings up the issue of the promises of God. We sing, standing on the promises, right? How often do we resort to the promises of God to strengthen our faith? when we're weak and when we're struggling spiritually. There are thousands of promises in the Bible, but a promise is only as good as the integrity and character of the one who gives it, right? The good news is that God has a perfect track record in keeping his promises. He never broke a promise, he's kept them all. Well, what does this point us to? Think with me for a minute. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when someone promises you something? What's the first thing you think? Will he keep his promise? And when you consider the chances of that happening, what do you think about next? You're now face to face with the core issue, the person's character. It's not so much somebody making a promise to you. It's will they keep it and what will be the guarantee that they will keep it? Well, underneath all of it is their character. What's their track record like in keeping their promises? Well, if you can think, well, so-and-so never broke their promise to me. Well, then you're encouraged, right? it would be likely for that person to keep that promise made to you. But being a human being, it's also likely that that person, that same person may break the promise one day because they're human, they're sinful, but not so with God. Is the person as good as their word? That's the core issue. 
There's no signed contract, no attorneys, no courts. It all comes down to one question. Does God have the integrity to keep his word perfectly? That's the bottom line issue when we talk about the promises of God. All who profess to be Christians have experience with this in their relationship with God. We've all had to address the promises of God prior to our conversion, did we not? Do you remember when you became a Christian? You faced the scary question, are God's promises reliable enough to call upon Christ for salvation and for him to hear me and save me, though I've never seen him before, though I've never heard his voice? You remember wrestling with that when you were on the path to becoming saved in one way or another? Can I trust God? Can I believe his word that he will save my soul through the Lord Jesus Christ? Though I've never seen Christ, heard his audible voice. Is the Bible's description of my need to be delivered from the condemnation of the law, to be saved from hell, forgiven of my sins and saved by Jesus Christ, the only savior of sinners, the only one. Is the Bible's description of the path and way of salvation trustworthy enough to base the giving of my entire life to Jesus Christ. Well, what happened when, when the Lord brought this to your attention and you were confronted with your sin and your need of salvation? Did you trust his promise? What happened? Did he keep his word in, in your life? Were you changed? Were you born from above? Because he certainly didn't give you any evidence Hard facts. You had to trust his word, his promise in scripture. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you remember confronting those issues when you were first wrestling with your sin, calling upon the name of the Lord to be saved? Well, a similar situation is taking place in Hebrews. But the people addressed are not unconverted people. Generally, some of them may be as professing counterfeit Christians, but God addresses them as believers. People who have given their life, their lives to Christ based on their belief in the integrity of God's character and therefore believe that God will keep his word and that he cannot lie and that he will preserve their salvation. He will guard and keep them unto the last day. Let's continue. Uh, in, in verse four, uh, 13, it says that God could swear by no one greater, so he swore by himself. Verse 14 saying, certainly I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply you. That's the promise quoted from Genesis 22. And now verse 15. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. After Abraham patiently endured. Notice the application. He's making a parallel application between Abraham and us. We need to patiently endure. If you don't patiently endure, you will not obtain the promise. The promise of what? The promise of salvation. The promise of sanctification and all the benefits that come with those promises. He that endures to the end shall be saved with respect to salvation. Now, yes, believers are secure. We believe in the preservation of the saints and the perseverance of the saints. But we have strong exhortations to make it to the end and not to presume upon God's grace, though we be secure. So in the case of Abraham, he believed God. He trusted in the truthfulness, integrity, and perfect honesty and veracity of God's character. So he thought, when God makes this promise, I believe him because God is perfect. He cannot lie. He's truthful every single time. And that God would eventually perform what he promised to do in Abraham's life and grant him a son. In the meantime, there was this waiting process which God describes as patiently endured. Look at it. So after he had patiently endured, that's an important phrase. 
Actually, Abraham was not taking a chance in believing God. It wasn't a roll of the dice or a shot in the dark. No risk was involved, actually, because the word of God is the surest thing in the universe as is the promise of God. Any promise of God is as certain of being fulfilled as if it had already taken place. Because God can't lie. When he gives his word, when he gives a promise, he keeps it every single time. I want you to note the close connection between faith and patience in the example of Abraham. <clears throat> I'll use a different text this time from Romans 4, verses 16 through 22. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed. Notice that the promise might be sure to all the seed, the spiritual seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, that is the spiritual seed of Abraham, who is the father of us all. <clears throat> as it is written, I have made you a father <clears throat> of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the, de the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope, in hope believe, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. Very important point. God waited 25 years so that Abraham was past child conceiving age, and his wife, Sarah, was 90. She was past childbearing age. He waited all that time while he was maturing their faith and testing their faith to see if they would just hold on to that promise that God made when he was 75 and she was 65. So that they would have to get to the point in their 90s where they were led to the conclusion that God would have to perform a miracle to fulfill the promise. And the same thing is true with us. The application is when we are tempted to go back, we think to ourselves sometimes, I don't know how I'm going to be able to withstand the pressure to fall into temptation and go back to my former way of life as a slave of sin. I'm just going to have to trust God to do a miracle and preserve my body and prevent my body from giving itself over to the lust of the flesh and being consumed by this wickedness. And that's exactly what God does. But you, like Abraham and me, we must daily renew our faith in the promise of God. And this is where we get into trouble. Abraham clung to the hope that God would fulfill his promise. He had to step outside the normal bounds where faith doesn't usually go. He had to trust in God for a miracle to provide a son when he and his wife were not able to have one in the normal course of things. And the same thing is going to happen to you as you grow older and older in Christ. The pressure is going to get greater and greater in every way upon you, emotionally, spiritually, and physically, and financially. Like these first century Hebrew Christians, as they got older in the faith, the spiritual pressures grew upon them. As the decades went by, and their former life was just in the very, very far distance. The older you get in Christ, that old life is, is so farther and farther away. And they began to think no more family, no more relations with mothers and fathers and children. I am not going to be able to enjoy anything of this world or very much of this world as I get older because the temptations get greater and the pressures get greater upon us as Christians. So you and I are going to need our daily miracle of grace to keep us. Not only just to barely keep us, but to grow and mature in a positive sense in the faith. Are you doing that? Are you growing? Are you maturing? 
Well, the key here is the phrase patiently endured. You need to be patient with the word of exhortation. You need to be patient as God trains you and chastises you to show you that you are not the mature Christian you thought you were because you were relying upon your own strength. He exposes the weaknesses of your heart after you've been saved 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years and shows you your only source of grace and strength is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and patiently enduring, trusting in Him for your miracle of grace daily that you need to be renewed in the spirit of your mind to have your faith renewed. Are you following me, brethren? Just like when you and I were redeemed and justified, it was a miracle of God. Sanctification is the same thing. You and I need a miracle to make it. And if you're not exercising faith and maturing and growing, some of, of us who claim to be Christians are going to fall into this category of apostatizing. Apostatizing. The strength of the flesh will only last so long. You and I must patiently endure. We must grow. In our text, the phrase patiently endured is the exact opposite of slothful or sluggish, which is the problem that many of these believers were having as we read in verse 12, the previous a couple of verses ago, he says that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience Inherit the promises. Notice, faith and patience go together. Let's continue reading Romans 4, picking it up at uh, verse uh, 19. And not being weak in faith, he did, not an he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith giving glory to God. That's maturity. That's growing in the midst of weakness. And being fully convinced that what he was promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. And many of you know, the readers of this letter to the Hebrews were about to give up. Their endurance was running out. Later in Hebrews, he exhorts them in chapter 12, verse 1. He says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with what? Endurance or patience the race that is set before us. Patience and endurance. So, the principles of patience and endurance, or patient endurance is critical to overcoming wandering, backsliding, and apostasy. Are you hearing me? You sh struggling with that? Wandering, backsliding, maybe the seeds of apostasy being sown? Patient endurance is the answer. Where do we get such grace? From the Lord Jesus Christ, by faith in his blood. What's the point? Paul is saying that you will obtain and enjoy what God has promised if you diligently apply yourself to the development of your spiritual life and to maturing in the faith. Are you doing that? Search your hearts. You will obtain and enjoy what God has promised. He made a promise to us if you diligently apply yourself to the deepening of your spiritual life and to maturing in the faith. That's got to be a priority. It's not good enough just to go to church on Sunday. There's got to be a spiritual, dynamic, alive and active in your life called spiritually growing, spiritual maturity. This process begins, first of all, negatively with a complete and thorough repentance of all sin, of all worldliness, all compromise, all defilement of conscience, all hardness of heart, all lukewarmness, and all complacency. 
you will not pick up where you left off in the growth and maturity process unless you repent of the complacency and the compromise and the worldliness and the hardness of heart that has held you back from growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. But secondly, positively, it means that having now received a powerful revelation on developing your spiritual life and maturing in the faith, and we need to be woke up sometimes. We need a powerful revelation that we need to be maturing in the faith and growing spiritually. That's a positive thing to have that revelation. If you have it, you will establish deep-rooted convictions and a strong commitment and a changed lifestyle in accomplishing these goals by God's grace. You and I need an awakening to where we have been, but especially in a positive sense to where we need to go in growing and maturing in the faith. If that awakening is, if we are to have strong convictions that this is what I need to go, this is the direction I need to go moving forward. I'm so tired of living the last five, 10, 20 years as an ineffective witness, as a weak believer. Yes, there's always an element of weakness, but there's a difference between that lifestyle and actually proactively growing and maturing in the faith. So that though once in a while I have one step backward, yet I'm always taking two steps forward so that I'm making forward progress in the end. You've, there's got to be a powerful revelation that that is the path that God wants you to be on, a path of growth and maturity. And that needs to be so powerful, a revelation and awakening, that your, it affects your convictions, it affects your commitment, it affects your lifestyle, it adjusts your path to putting yourself in that place where you will, you will see growth. You will experience the grace of God leading to maturity. Thirdly, in overcoming wanderings, backslidings, and the beginnings of apostasy, it is essential to understand and apply the principles of spiritual maturity in the Bible. There are many who just don't even understand what spiritual maturity is and growth, making progress in your spiritual life. They think that they made their commitment to Christ, they became a Christian, they said their prayer, and now they can just do what they want to do. And they basically live the same life, they may with a little bit of sprinkling of religion, they, they know very little or nothing of the spirit-filled life that characterizes regular spiritual growth and maturity. But to do so, to experience maturity, it's essential to first of all understand and apply the principles of this maturity in your life. And what are they? Well, the first one we've already talked about, it's patient endurance. It's not how you start that matters, it's how you finish. And if you're gonna grow and mature in, in your Christian life, you're gonna, you're gonna need to realize that there are going to be setbacks, there's gonna be roadblocks, there's gonna be stumblings. But you need to prepare for and allow for resiliency in response to those stumbling blocks. In other words, when you experience a setback, you have a mountaintop experience, but then you have a setback and you fall into a valley, you cannot be so traumatized by that, that you take another five years off from walking with Christ in the inner sanctuary of your heart. Maturity means that you need to overcome, you need to be prepared for setbacks and what you're going to do spiritually, like patiently enduring, like rebounding very quickly. You need to understand and apply the principles of spiritual maturity, including patient endurance, also daily use of the means of grace. They have to be so 
much an integral part of your life using the Word of God, meditation, and prayer. Much and richly in your life. Understanding and applying the principles of maturity means that you have to experience organic union and communion with the local church. There's no such thing as a church goer in understanding our relationship with the local church. It's not just showing up on Sunday for a couple of hours. The Bible teaches that the nature of the, of the new covenant church is that it is an organic union and without your life, your heart, your spiritual gifts intertwined into the life, the heart, and the spiritual, and with the spiritual gifts of the assembly, then that is, uh, then you're, you don't understand what the local church is in essence. It is an organic union and communion with one another, which is descriptive of using spiritual gifts, bearing one another's burdens, showing hospitality, getting involved in the spiritual life of the body, not just getting together and talk about the world, but actually exercising spiritual gifts, having a spiritual mindedness when we show up at church, through faith, expecting God to open doors of opportunity to minister to one another in the spirit, praying for one another and with one another spontaneously because we're so in tune and we so understand the organic nature of the church. But in our society, very, very often, we don't have the time to prepare in such a way. But the Bible says if you're going to mature, you need to prepare because the other gifts of the body and the other parts of the body are also designed by God to help you mature and grow in the faith. And if you don't avail yourself of that, then there's a lack of maturing, a retardation of that re maturing process taking place. If you just show up on Sunday, I'm not happy and God's not happy because anyone worth their salt, whether they be in leadership or as rank and file members of the local church that understands the spiritual nature of the church knows that there's got to be an active spiritual organic exchange between the members one of another for them to grow. Read Ephesians chapter 4. It also includes the attendance of the public means of grace. When you worship in the spirit and pray in the spirit corporately, when you have Bible study corporately, when you evangelize, these are spiritual activities that with our participation in them accelerates maturity. But the most important element in overcoming wanderings and backslidings and the seeds of apostasy is primarily faith in Jesus Christ, a lively, active, faith and trust in Christ that brings down grace and power and love and strength and fresh life and light shining inside our spiritual man. Now also regarding patient endurance, this is a doctrine closely connected to the gospel and the perseverance of the saints, especially as patience relates to spiritual maturity and perseverance. Patience is very important to help us persevere and not get bogged down in these wanderings and backslidings for weeks and months at a time. Let me just lay out some, some biblical truths in this area concerning the importance of patience as it relates to maturity and perseverance. We read in Revelation 2, 3, Jesus says to the church at Ephesus, you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Now that's encouraging. Jesus was looking for patience and perseverance in them. He identifies and acknowledges that. He says, you have patience and have persevered. The Lord is looking for that in us. If we are to mature, we've got to patiently endure. We've got to have patience, resilience, faithfulness, 
in overcoming long-term back, uh, or, uh, backslidings and setbacks spiritually so that the forward movement of maturity stops and then reverses so that we revert back to Christian babyhood as described in chapter 5, which we've already looked at, where the apostle says, by this time you should be teachers, but you have need of someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. So we're either moving forward or we're moving backward. And just because on the surface you think you're doing okay with your knowledge of the scripture, spiritually beneath the service, surface that is unnoticeable to us, we're moving backward. And we're so blinded by, the, by our situation that we rely upon our head knowledge as an indication of our spiritual health when it isn't necessarily. Amen? Amen. James 1, 2 through 4 says, My brethren, count on all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Patience. Patience, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Sometimes the fiery darts of the devil and our own sins shock us so greatly from our place of, of having a clear conscience and, a, and clean hands and a pure heart, short accounts with God, that we don't allow the the, the, the restarting of maturity, the restarting of the process of growing to take hold and to gain traction and take effect in a powerful way. We don't let patience have its perfect work. What does that mean? In other words, when you have a setback, rebound quickly so that your patience can, can be extended for longer and longer periods. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, when he has been approved, when he gets through to the other side, he will receive the crown of life which, life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Therefore, we read in James 5, be patient, brethren. He says to Christians, therefore, be patient, brethren. When? How long? Until the coming of the Lord. Don't be patient for a week until you get shocked out of your place of comfort and peace with the Lord, and that's a wonderful place to be. Be wise as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. You also be like a farmer. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Look at other people who are patient. Look at other people who have been saved 30, 40, 50 years. And imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Imitate them. For whatever things were written before for our they were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Remember what Jesus said. By your patience, possess your souls. So let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. Well, that's just the first point of three points. The next is the oath. The second thing is the oath. We will not get to that today. Don't say amen. <laughs> but be encouraged. Be encouraged. Because we have God's promise in Christ. He who freely gave us his own son, shall he not with him give us all things? We have Christ. We have his promise. We have his oath. And we have his son. God willing, next time we'll look at the latter too. Now, if God gives us a promise, why does he also have to take an oath? I've given you a promise, and now I take an oath. I'm going to keep my promise. That's powerful truth there. If anybody doesn't have to double down, it's God. His promise is good enough for me. Lord, I don't need you to take an oath on top of it. But he takes an oath. <laughs> 
as well, which brings certainty, more than certainty, that you and I are going to make it until the end of our lives. Christ is the last part of it. The high priest, he gave us his promise, he gave us his oath, and he's given us a high priest who was also the sacrifice himself. He gave us the high priest. Those three things we have, they are very sure and steadfast. When you trust in Christ to help you and to make progress in maturing and growing in the faith, you will make it to the end by his grace. Will you do that today? Will you look to Christ? Look to him. Trust in him. Faith must be activated. It must be exercised. Trust in him. And you will see, you will see yourself jump-started and moving forward and growing. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this promise that we have examined in your word. The promise that you have given to us in many forms and in many ways, but especially of Christ, who not only is our justification, but also our sanctification. We pray that you will teach us how to grow consistently and mature consistently so that we can reduce and even eliminate those times of wanderings and backslidings and destroy the seeds of apostasy sown in our hearts sometimes every day that we can keep our heads above water even though we still remain weak and you alone are our strength but that we can we can experience tangible growth over the coming days and months. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.